Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Coffee with Casey, where every Thursday we take a look at the market, some market strategies, things that are right, things that are wrong. Um, you know, it dawned on me that last week, so we were at the beach, we were celebrating Billy and Callie's wedding. And um, then I was going to say up front, hey, I'm at the beach, I got my hat turned on backwards, sunglasses, you know, some uh, t-shirt on. And it wasn't until I got halfway through, I was so into the show that I got halfway through. It's like, I guess I better explain why I'm dressed in a t-shirt and a hat bomb backwards. So we were at the beach last week. It was a great wedding, great family event. So let's get to back to the market and see where we are. Um, you know, today we're going to talk about avoiding just a huge mistake. You know, it's funny in really, really good sellers markets, you can possibly get away with mistakes, but as markets tend to go back to neutral markets, you really can't make that mistake. Two years ago, we would measure a market by how many homes withdrew versus how many homes sold. So when you listed a house for sale, 60% would sell, 40% would withdraw or expire unsold. They would be unsuccessful. And that's a market average, not our average, but a market average. So in the last two years, really pretty much everything is sold. And the indicator to whether you're getting a good deal or a bad deal was what, how high was the percentage versus your assessment that you would sell your houses. So our house is sold at, let's say 131% of the assessed value. And the other, the rest of the market was at 121% of the assessed value. So we kind of knew the strategies were still working and everything was fine. And, you know, our clients, you know, whatever marketing strategies and pricing strategies we have are working, but we're going to go back into that. We're going to go back into the, um, I, I don't think I was live there. So anyways, let's go back and just tell you that how we measure the market is going to change, right? We haven't seen for uh, withdrawals and expired listings in a long time, but they're coming back. They're going to come back pretty strong here. So let me, let's go to the screen. If you make a mistake in this market, you're going to have to pay for it. So let's take a look at the current market conditions, right, in Northern Virginia. All right. So today we're going to talk about avoiding a huge mistake. Um, this is a mistake that, that we're asked to make every weekend. And I get angry when they do ask me to make this mistake. And we, uh, you know, we don't uh, take that tack. And I'll talk about that in a little while. We're going to go over the key market indicators. What are the things that really tell us whether the market's really humming or not? Um, I'm going to go over the best lenders. I don't think everybody understands when you're going to put a contract in, the lender is critically important to um, whether a listing agent has confidence in that contract or not. So we really want to make sure that you guys have the best lender. So we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about gimmicks versus helpful hints. Now, again, are helpful tools. Again, you could, anybody put a house on the market and it's going to sell. The question is how much, how high, how fast, um, what percentage of assessment. So pretty much everybody could sell it. But now it's going to go back to, hey, 25, 30, 40 percent of the homes are not going to sell. So what really are the helpful things to get you to sell versus what are the gimmicks that some people are, are advertising? So, so let's first take a look at the market. And as you know, the most important thing is how many homes are under contract in a specific market. So if 10 homes are on the market in Arlington, five are under contract. Well, that tells me that 50% or 49% are not under contract. So that's pretty pretty good market for if you're a buyer, you'd rather be looking down here when there's only half the houses under contract, as opposed to in Reston, 75% of the houses are under contract. Now, why are these numbers important? Well, we're talking about how much leverage does a seller have? This seller has a ton of leverage. This seller has very little leverage. So we want to know how many homes are under contract and then analyze the ones that are under contract. Are they just overpriced? Are they what we would call a dumpster firehouse that is, is really not been fixed up or does it look well? Overpriced? So we want to analyze those, those houses. And in some cases, hey, I may have three competitors, but two of them are not really a competitor because they're overpriced, uh, prepared poorly, um, uh, displayed poorly on the internet and they've been sitting around for 20 to 90 days. 
So I don't consider those to be competitors, all right? So if you look around, we're gonna see that, you know, pretty much 58% on average is under contract. So you'll see back here in January, 78% of those homes were under contract when you take all those towns together. And then as the, as the summer is progressing now, you're seeing it's just start to wind down. There goes the spring, here goes May. This is the first week of June, right? So here's where we are currently at 58%. So the power and the leverage that the sellers had is leaving um, again, 60%, over 60% is a seller's market. So, you know, some markets have slipped down a little lower than others. So, but it's nice and it's good to know that you can see that that seller's market is starting to wean and we need to be cognizant of that when we're putting our houses on the market, okay? So let's take a look at this. This is a really good indicator of how we're doing. And let me explain what this is. So I went back and I took um, first real week of, um, of January, February, March, April, May, and June, okay? I went back to 2019 and I said, in 2019, how many homes were put on the market and how many of them went under contract in that first seven days? Seven days is important because that's when everybody's bidding the price up, right? So 42% of the homes in January of 2019 sold in that first seven day period. This year, 75%. That's why you kept feeling everybody's going on a contract, everybody's bidding. So you see the excitement up here where they really didn't have it back in 2019. This is a normal market. This is what we've just experienced, okay? As you can see, that's coming down. Now, in June, so far in June, the homes that have been listed, only 46% of those homes went under contract in that first seven days, right? So, you know, is it starting to be a little more nerve wracking? Yes, it is. And we've watched the market go from 13 contracts to six contracts to sometimes one contract. So we don't have time to make a mistake, right? We can't make mistakes around here. This is just the average for the whole year. So you can see, obviously, it's although it's better than it was in 2019, we need to be more cognizant. Now, this week, we had a home, and every week, right? We have homes that go on the market. So last week, we had a house. I was extremely nervous. Love the house. Very nice house. I was extremely nervous. We did our predictive analysis. We put it on a week early. We looked at it. And this is, this is really critical, right? What I'm about to say is very, very important. So we, we had it on at a certain number. We were not getting the buyer pool. We were not getting the love. We weren't getting the favorites. We weren't getting all of that. So, so although the sellers are expecting 50,000 more than I'm listing it for, we don't have the buyer pool to generate multiple contracts. So what we do is we do a predictive analysis that we do not have enough buyers in that buyer pool at that number. We drop it $50,000. Now I need to have that conversation with about half my sellers every weekend. Not a very, it's a very unnerving um, conversation to have to say, I know we want this, but we got to go down here to get it. But thank goodness the sellers have trust in the team and our track record that they went ahead and did that. So they dropped the price $50,000. We received contracts 150,000 over that list price. So can you still get 150 over list price? The answer is yes. Are we still getting, but not a ton of contracts, right? Perfect buyers, not a ton of contracts. So the search for the buyers continues. Finding the right buyer pool is critical. If, if we were getting ready to go off at, and I can disclose this number now because it's settling, we were going to go off at 1.4 million uh, because the seller wanted to get 1.45. We weren't getting the traction there, so we dropped it to 1.35. Another difficult conversation to have with the seller. If you want to get more, you got to drop to less. Find the buyer pool. So we did. We went to 1.35. We got 1.557. So we got $207,000 over list price. But if we had not dropped, there was only two people coming to look at the house, right? 
So you had nobody interested. There was nobody coming to see it. Two is not enough to generate contracts. Maybe one, but at list price. So by a seller going down that extra $50,000, I mean, I really have to tell you, I think it made them 150,000. I think they made at least $150,000 on that decision. So is it tough for me to have with my sellers that, hey, in order to get this, we need to go down? Um, sure. But, you know, the track record is there. So, so all of the agents right now have to be extremely careful, right, that you may think it's worth 1.45, but the biggest number you're looking at was what did everybody ask? to get that number. So there is now a $100,000 difference between what the sales prices were and what the sellers were asking, right? You want 1.4, you ask 1.3, then you 1.45. So you have to be very careful. You have to be careful where you're listing it. You have to test that for seven days. We need to have that tough conversation prior to launch to make sure that we have the buyer pool. <coughs> And if we don't and have to move that price, there's plenty of track record that shows when you move the price, you get 150,000 over list. So that's, that's very, very important. So as we go into this next phase where we're, the seller's market is leaving and now we're really you know, competing, we need to analyze each market like we've always talked about. We need to make sure that the buyer pool is there during coming soon. We need to make sure we have enough showings. We need to make sure that enough people are favoring the house that we have confidence that we can generate multiple contracts and then run that price back up, okay? So let's talk about some strategies that you see in the market, right? Or you hear in the market. And one of them is, I will guarantee to buy your home if it doesn't sell for list price. Well, that's bunk, okay? Let me tell you how that is bunk. Because if you go to the teams that say that, they only, buy, they only are on both sides of the transaction 4% of the time. Well, the market average is if Long and Foster Vienna lists a house, 5% of the time they'll sell it themselves. So it's 5% is about the average, right? Those teams that brag about that, 4% is the average. So that's that's a gimmick. That is, that is nobody's going to sell their house at 80 cents on the dollar. So the companies that do this will even tell the realtors, we have one. Samson Properties has one. I just don't promote it because I just think it's a gimmick, right? But we have it, it gets you in the front door. The companies will even tell you, it's just getting you in the front door. Then you do what you gotta do. So that's a gimmick. If you hear that, that's that's just bunk. Um, exclusive listings. Okay, so here's, here's, let me give you an example of this. It just happened this week. We're putting a house on the market for X amount of dollars. Another house in the neighborhood went on for X amount of dollars, but it never really made it to the market. Somebody made him an offer. They, they didn't even go live. They took the offer, right? And marked the home as under contract. The buyer walked, the buyer walked. So the agent reaches out to all of us agents, right? And says, hey, this is gonna be an in-house listing. It's a pocket listing. Um, if you have somebody, let us know. And, and um, you know, you can come and show. Well, you just shrank the market from 2000 agents showing your house to about six, right? So our goal is to go like this. So the mistake they made was accepting a contract, accepting it early, having no backup contracts. So now you went under contract and now you go, got to go back on the market. Somebody thinks something's wrong with that house. Either you flunked a home inspection, you flunked financing, it didn't appraise for whatever reason, your home had to come back on the market. Buyers see that, realtors see that. And that's why when somebody brings us a contract, even a great contract, and says, hey, um, you know, we'll give you 100,000 over list price, all cash and, you know, no contingencies or whatever. We're not taking it. We're not going to take a contract unless we have some serious backups for that contract in case everybody sees it. I don't know that $100,000 is where it's going to end up. It could be 200,000. It could be 300,000. I have no idea. The buyers, when the buyers get in there, it matters the buyer pool, where they're from, how much they value this house. If you get two people, one from AWS and another from Google fighting over it, it could go $300,000 over the price. They're thinking West Coast pricing. We're thinking East Coast pricing. 
they could be at a different level. So, you know, this pocket listing, this exclusive, you know, buyer listing stuff, that is a gimmick. That is not what you want. We do not want to expose the, mar the house to 5% of the market. We want to expose it to 100% of the market. And I'll go even further than that. 100% of the market is what's looking at your house. If you go beyond that, there are people looking in Arlington that are not looking in Vienna, that are looking in McLean and not looking in Vienna. So our marketing literally just doesn't take care of the 100% that's looking at it in our area. It goes out, reaches out to all of the McLean, Arlington, Alexandria, DC, uh, Bethesda buyers, where this $1.5 million house in Arlington is $2.1 million. So if I introduce my $1.5 million house using geofencing and Google ads, if I can introduce this $1.5 million house to a person currently looking at the same house for $2.1 million, he's going to come out, he's going to bid, he's going to pay 1.7. So again, if our average home sells at 131% of assessment and the market is at 121, there's some reason why we're getting more. Now, part of it is making sure that we're at the perfect price, right? Do we have a buyer pool that's willing to bid? The other half may be the marketing. We want to make sure that all these people are coming in. If they're looking somewhere else in a more expensive area, they see our house, right? So, so exclusive listings in a company is a gimmick, right? The best practices is introduce it to as many people as you can in your market and then introduce it to people that are not looking in your market. And that's how you get the biggest buyer pool looking at your house. Staging. An agent will come in and say, hey, I'll stage your house, charge you 6% and I'll stage your house, I'll even pay for it. Well, our average listing sell in four days. We don't stage houses, we prepare homes correctly. You know, we may even have an interior designer come in and set, set stuff, but you have to pay for a three month contract to stage. That's, that's a waste of money, right? We're gonna sell it in the first weekend and that's 95% of our houses. So no, staging is a gimmick. Paying 6% is a gimmick. That is, they say, hey, you have to pay that if you want the best service, if you want the best this. Now, a big portion of that is going to the company, Long and Foster, Weikert, Keller Williams, Compass. Compass agents are having to pay back their debt, right? They gave them $150,000, $200,000 to join Compass. A portion of their commission has to go back to that company to pay that off. So, so money that you're paying at a 6% is going back to the company and the companies aren't going to help you sell a house. An agent has the pricing strategy, marketing plan, prepare the house, handle the contracts. Nowhere in that equation does a company help you out. In fact, let me put it to you this way. Companies can actually hurt. And let me give you an example. A real agent, somebody really knows what they're doing knows how to price a house and really knows how to lock in a price. They should, they really should. I'm surprised somebody don't, but they should. But one of the big companies, well, we're high tech, we're high tech. We got algorithms that'll tell you what a house is worth. So I've looked at a couple of their analysts of what they think a house is worth. Absolutely 100% incorrect, just totally wrong. You have to do it by hand. So in my opinion, there's a lot of people that say Compass, has a engine that prices houses for them and produces a 26 page report, it's garbage. I've seen three, I disagree with all three of them. So in some cases, good agents using some new tools really should be using their old tools, really should stay with their old tools. They should know how to price a house. They're smart, they know what they're doing. They've been doing this a long time. So I think some companies can even hurt agents. The other thing um, you may hear about is videos and 3D models. So Matterhorn has a 3D model where you can go in the house. Very cool. It is absolutely very cool. Um, but here's the problem. When you get in the house, everything is a little blurry. It isn't as sharp as it should be. Uh, you get confused and you only stay there for 18, 20 seconds. And I know that because we used it and I monitored. And those people stayed in that that house for about 15 to 18 seconds and then bugged out. So the models really don't work. A video, I can't watch more than 15 to 18 seconds of video, neither can you. You go on, hear some nice music and here we're coming up the driveway. 
All you want to see is kitchens, master bedroom, bathrooms. What does the house look like? What are the lighting fixtures? What are the plumbing fixtures? What is the backyard? You want to go. We're moving. We don't sit around and wait for videos that is going to get to the master bedroom bathroom in three and a half minutes. We want that now. So the videos too long, too blurry, too blurry, right? So the best way to do it is pictures, a lot of them, spectacular pictures, flambian pictures, no flash, no, no flash photography. Let me, let me just give you an example. Let me show you something here real quick. I'm going to get out of here. I'm gonna see if I have a, a listing presentation open. I do. Let me show you something here. Let's see pictures. Watch this. All right. So this is what picture. This was uh, came from the patch. Um, an agent had this on. Look at how blurry all of those windows are, and how how really blurry that looks. That is flambian photography. See how sharp it looks, how you can see that. I mean, you can see all that outdoors comes indoors. Not this, this. This is flash, this is flambian. This is flash, this is a $2 million house, long and foster out on the market. Look at the windows. That's our listing when we took it over and sold it. And the first weekend was six contracts. Look at the windows. You're looking for that sharp look. Again, this was a, uh, see how the flash photography blurs those windows out? That's what Flambian looks like. Now, if you're in Arlington and you're deciding, am I going to come out and look at this house? Am I going to drive 40 minutes to come out and look at this house? Look at the backyard. Look at how blurry it is. Look how horrible it is. Now you look at this and go, you know, I could live there, right? Here's another one. A lot of these two-story things have all the, you know, palladium windows and everything. Look at how... Um, how washed out the windows are with flash photography. That's what it looks like with Flambia. I mean, you can tell that's a river, river birch in the backyard. So we don't want this, we want this. So when I'm talking about, um, you know, when I'm talking about pictures get you in the house, that's what I'm talking about. So movies, I don't think get you in there, uh, 3D, uh, things are not going to get you in there. What gets you in there are great, sharp pictures and a good story. So let's talk about another one, escalation clauses. And I'm going to tell you, oh, we allow escalation clauses. That lets people bid it on up. That's incorrect. What it does is people submit their contracts and say, I will do 5,000 more than the next closest contract. So let me give you an example within the last two or three weeks of what we saw. We had a couple contracts for one point, the high 1.2s. We had a couple contracts for 1.325, 1.335. We had one contract at 1.4. So what we do is highest and best offers, no escalation clause. Had we allowed escalation clause, this home would have sold for 100, uh, 1 1.3 million, $227,000. One, three, two, seven. It sold for one, four. So that's a $73,000 difference between escalation clauses. We allow people to bid wrong and highest and best offers. So highest and best offers. And it's amazing to me that my six agents that I have, it's amazing that we're number one in Fairfax County with six agents. And the number two group has 115 agents. But we call people all the time and say, we're going to put submit a contract. Do you allow escalation clauses? And it floors my agents when every time they say, oh, sure, we allow escalation clauses. It's only fair. Well, we would have cost our clients 75,000 in this case, or a hundred, in some cases, 150,000 bucks difference between the two bids. So uh, escalation clauses, gimmick, highest and best offer, that's money. That's real money. That's the helpful tool. Okay. International MLS, not, not a um, international MLS uh, is a gimmick. Absolute gimmick. People coming into this country are looking either have agents that represent them or can find them online. Our MLS puts it out to like 168 different websites around the world. Okay. So if you're looking for a house, in a certain price range, they already see it. You don't need a special international MLS. It sounds good. Again, it's a gimmick. 
it sounds good to a seller. Oh yes, we want to really get exposure to the international market. I think that's where our buyers are coming from. Actually, you'd be surprised, but statistics show that only 2% of the buyers are international and the average price those buyers pay is in the $450,000 range. So if you're looking for a $2 million house or a 1.5 or a $1.2 million house, trust me, you have an agent. The agent is helping you with your search. No matter what country you're coming from, you can still see our stuff online. And should you be from India and you're looking at a home in McLean, then we will post our, and we have a similar house in Vienna. We're going to post our house on your Facebook, your Instagram, your TikTok, your uh, Wall Street Journal feed or whatever you're reading, Google Ads is going to place our house in your ad. So that's the way you reach out to, that's the helpful tool, not the gimmick, okay? So anyways, that's, that's just a few things. And you know, when it all boils down to it, everybody can say whatever they want. Everybody has an opinion. You need as a seller and a buyer, you need to authenticate the person you're working with is really using helpful tools, not gimmicks, right? So how do you know that? Track record. Anytime you interview somebody, say, can you print out your track record? I just want to see how many days on the market, what percentage of assessment you sold, yada, yada, yada. Show me the houses you sold in my area, in my price range. You need to authenticate that whoever you're talking to really does good business and is a top, is a top agent. So again, sometimes people are confused. Sometimes people um, say, well, I heard this and I heard this and I heard this. When you hear they'll guarantee buys and they'll sell it exclusively, that's just gimmicks. It's really gimmicks and really you can't, there's no way to authenticate. The only authentication you can make is these people that guarantee buy or have exclusive listings or the one I love the most is Debbie. Debbie has the buyers. So Debbie has the buyers is right here. They sell 4% of their houses. The market is 5% of the houses. Compass sells 9% of the houses. Our team told, sold 27% of our listings, 27%. Well, why is that? Well, if we're in Vienna over a million dollars and you know five people just you know lost on a contract for a house, I got a similar house, who are the phone calls gonna go to, right? So we can get right out. But to be honest with you, what happens is everybody's fighting to get that house. They know what they're looking for. They'll come in, they'll say, hey, I'm gonna go through you guys. I need commissions. Just give me a big chunk of the commission and I'll go through you guys. Now, we do that because we get our lenders, we get our settlement title companies, we get our, you know, we get home field advantage through the whole thing. So let me let me then quickly switch to something that's important to um, important to a listing agent. If you're a buyer, part of your contract is who you're funding the property with. Now, smart listing agents, smart listing agents are looking for about five or six, what's called a correspondent lenders. So there's banks, banks play and federal credit unions. They play by different rules, a lot tighter rules. Their appraisers are coming from all over the place. If something goes wrong or a program is cut out, you have an 800, uh, an 800 number to call it's, it's a problem. It's a real problem. So those are the banks. We try to avoid the banks. Then you have brokers, people that we don't really know that much about. They're trying to place it with one of these banks using their underwriters and their appraisers. So a broker is just as bad as one of the banks. Maybe they could shop for better rates. And then there's a third thing called a correspondent lender. Now, correspondent lender, those are the big boys. Those are the ones that all listing agents want to see. First Heritage uh, is the group that we use, but there's McLean Mortgage, there's George Mason, there's Intercoastal, there's First Savings Bank. Now what these groups do is they will underwrite the loan in their in-house. They have appraisers that they know, local appraisers that they use. So the underwriting is better, the appraisal is better, the, the lenders, the actual loan officers you're working with are far more experienced. I mean, banks are sometimes order takers, but a correspondent lender, these guys hump. They work for a living. They're very, uh, girls and guys, obviously. But those are the, those are the 
professionals. So when I look out and I see George Mason is doing the uh, loan and I know who the loan officer is, I feel more comfortable with that contract. The same with First Heritage or McLean Mortgage or Intercoastal. When you know that these are the professionals and, and we're still going to compete for houses, if a good house comes on the market, you still have to compete. But I'm just saying one very critical, and, and um, I had one of my clients was saying, well, I'm a VA and I'm using um, Navy Federal Credit Union. Uh, I'm, I sold the house for the guy that ran Navy Federal Credit Union and he admitted, he goes, yeah, we, you know, we got tough underwriting, say tough appraisers, you know, it's, it's a little more difficult. And he admitted that, right? So when you present your contract, you should be approved by one of the big five or big six correspondent lenders. You, that's who your letter can come in from. Now, when you're done, should you go to Navy Federal and say, can I use a VA? Yes. Can I go through Navy Federal? Yes. You can do whatever you want. You can change financing, right? You can change financing, but you can't cost the seller any money and you can't, you can't cost the seller any money and you can't delay settlement, right? So you got to understand that. So if you're going to do it, you need to be able to make sure that they're going to be able to get there on time, not cost the seller any extra money. So we just had an FHA, um, conventional switch to FHA. FHA appraiser comes in and goes, hey, you got to repair, replace the HVAC unit in the, in the attic. And we, and so the buyer asked us to do it. And we pointed out that we're not doing anything because you switch financing. And by virtue of switching financing, you can't cost us any money, which is the cost of a new one, or delay settlement. So they, of course, agreed. And they are paying to have that fixed and have that, have that all done. So you can do it. You just have to make sure that you can't delay settlement. And you can't cost the seller any extra money. That's just, that's just how it is. So, but the key here is go get your house, compete for it. If you're going to compete, make sure you have one of the, a good lender because we really take that into account. We really do. And the agents, make sure you're working with a good agent. Don't just grab somebody off of a Redfin that you don't know anything about and they start submitting contracts for you. I'm just going to tell you, it doesn't look good. The listing agents know that they have no control over their buyers. And, um, and, and we're trying to mitigate the risk for the sellers. And when we see high risk lender or high risk agent, that's a red flag for us. So, so this is another edition of Coffee with Casey. Thanks for sticking around. Hope this helped. If you have any questions, you can give me a call 703-508-2535. Or you can reach me, uh, email me at Casey at CaseySampson.com. If you want to know what your house is worth, in this changing market, just text me at 703-508-2535 and say, Casey, what's my house worth? Please, can you tell me what my house is worth? All right, we'll see you guys uh, next week um, on Coffee with Casey. Bye, and again, congratulations to Billy and Callie. Long, happy life. Bye, guys.